So my name is Lisa Williams, and I run Place Blogger, which is probably one of my most well-known projects, which is a searchable index of local web logs, which is kind of like the AP, only with way more cat pictures. <laughs> All right. And uh, we have offices now in uh, the Cambridge Center for Innovation. This is a few blocks from MIT. Oh, wow. Somebody actually knows CIC. That's fantastic. There are 300 startups under one roof here. This is a sincere offer. If you make it to Cambridge, please come and let me show you around. And in my copious spare time, I also uh, work at the MIT Media Lab, where I focus on the future of news and civic engagement. I think a lot of people think that these labels are satirical. They're literal. OK. Now, I don't know if this is your first. No, really. It's, it's really the fun, fluffy part of MIT. Whenever anybody serious comes, I'm like, why are you visiting us? <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, now, I don't know if this is your first journalism conference or your 81st journalism conference. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize all journalism conferences, um, besides this one, in two slides. You get a lot of this, and then you get a hefty dollop of this on top. Right? And I don't know about you, but I'm sitting back there in the audience thinking, oh, this sucks. This is not what I want to hear. <laughs> right? You know, I want to talk about this. And so when I get the opportunity to go out across our fine nation and talk to people about that, that's exactly what I talk about. And of course, then you always get the question, Lisa, how do you propose to save journalism? Right? And I don't answer that question, and I'll tell you why. This is a picture of my mother. She looks so sweet, doesn't she? You know, yeah, don't be fooled. She drowned all the stupid children, right? I'm an only child now, right? So instead, I talk about all the great things that technology and entrepreneurialism can do for people who want to do journalism or people who want to act in the civic interest. And then I get another question. I get the, but Lisa, does everybody have to learn how to program? Isn't storytelling important anymore? And I give, you know, the polite answer which isn't just a polite answer, it's a, it's a real and truthful answer, which is the answer is no, not everybody has to do it, and yes, storytelling is important, but just for today, I have a special opportunity. I'm gonna tell you this, the answer that's like burning a hole in my head every time somebody asks that, which is, do you know how whiny you sound? <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know? I, you know, no, you don't have to learn to program, you don't have to acquire any technical skills at all, ever, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. Somebody, so, somebody can smack me on the hand later. This one's a little mean. I realize that, you know. This is, this is kind of a snarky slide, but, um, but I get a little bit more sincere later, maybe. Um, so, no, you don't have to learn any of this stuff. You don't have to learn unless you want to have a little fun or, you know, experience a tiny shred of job security. You know, if you're not interested in either of those things, that's fine, okay? You can just move along. But if you are, in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna tell you how to go about figuring out how, how to acquire some of this knowledge, how to figure out what you're interested in, and why to do it. Well, but first, I wanna talk a little bit about the excuses, right? I have all these excuses, too. The biggest one that I hear from people is, well, I don't have time. And this is the one that I have a lot of sympathy for. It's a real issue. And I think that busy people don't want to make open-ended time commitments. And especially when you're trying to learn something that is a little bit difficult, um, I think it's more than just, I don't know how long it's going to take me from the time I start until the time I can get to the place where I can do something useful. I don't even know if I'm ever going to get there at all. right? So I didn't want to give people these advice unless I could take it myself. So I started teaching myself, and in about eight weeks, of uh, doing it for about an hour a day weekdays. At the end of those eight weeks, I could make simple applications that I myself use, and in fact, two of them I still use every day. So it is doable if you start in the right place. Now the other excuse that I often hear, we can't list all the excuses because it would take too long, is the Lisa Williams is a magical unicorn excuse, right? I have to tell you, I love this one. Right? You know, they're like, they're like you know, you, you work at MIT, you must have all this special technical stuff. You probably have technical DNA. You're a computer person. I'm not a computer person. You know, but the fact is, ordinary people can learn this. And as much as I love this excuse, that rainbow poop in my backyard, not mine. <laughs> right? So, you know, as we start to move into this era of ordinary people who have no intention of doing computer programming for a living, um, starting to learn a little computer skills, um, there's been kind of a backlash that kind of reminds me of the bloggers versus journalists of, journalist war of 2005. You know, there's a lot of like, why are you learning this? 
Leave this to the professionals. What do you think you're doing? Now, I have to tell you, I just don't understand arguments that tell people not to learn things, right? It's kind of like saying, why are you learning to cook? What, do you think you're going to open a restaurant, you loser? You know? Well, OK. All right. I take that back. I do understand some arguments for some people not to learn some things. I mean, does anybody want to live in a world where these guys have access to Photoshop? <laughs> not me, baby. Right? But looking around at you guys, I think I can trust you guys. You have very trustworthy looking faces. I can trust you to use your new technical superpowers for good, or at least only for moderate evil. You know, so we'll get along to how. You know, before I get started with that, I want to say that there are some forms of com uh, computer programming happening in the news industry that are genuinely sophisticated rocket science type stuff. One of my favorite examples of this is the Overview Project at AP, which will take these massive document dumps and instantly make these huge entity relationship diagrams. And it's more than just a tag cloud. Those different colors actually represent different categories of re and relationships of things that the machine figures out by itself. And you can play them through time. So I once saw a demo of this where they put in the Iraq, the, um, the Afghanistan war logs and played the war through time. I mean, it was really chilling and amazing how much understanding you could get just out of that, right? But I have really good news, great news for you. Most of the kind of programming that journalism requires is really simple. And I mean really, really, really simple. This is the kind of programming that a zombie can do on an empty stomach because you don't need more brains, right? You know, so if you want to, if you aspire to start doing some of this stuff, I would say there are three endpoints that you should start thinking about. Things that are simple enough to do, but powerful enough to actually get you a decent result. And number one would be scraping it. Scraping is when you write a little program to go and fetch data where it's trapped in some crappy government website or in some awful PDF. Right, so you can stuff it in a database or even just put it in an Excel spreadsheet so you can use it for your stories. The second thing I would say is grabbing it. There are so many open APIs. API stands for Application Programming Interface, and now you don't know anything more than when I started and calling it an API, right? What it really means is that it's an open doorway to other people's data, other people's data and other people's websites. So you can write a small program that goes and fetches data from them to use in your own stuff. Like for instance, the New York Times has an API. I could write a small program that went and fetched movie reviews and sorted them according to criteria that matter to me as a viewer to make something to help me figure out what to watch this weekend. And the last thing is visualization. In particular, mapping. Mapping tools have gotten so incredibly powerful um, that I think that's a really powerful visualization tool for people who want to do journalism or act in the public interest. That's a really good starting point. I have to say that I didn't use any of these as starting points. My first programs were literally and figuratively CRUD. And by that, I mean create, read, update, and delete. <laughs> and uh, CRUD, when we, say something, when we say something's a CRUD application or you learn how to do CRUD applications, what it means is that I know, <coughs> excuse me, I know how to make a record and put it into a database, read it and bring it back to myself, update it and change it if I need to, and get rid of it when I'm done. Those were the first applications that I learned how to do, and it's the basis of a lot of the work that I do today still. Um, when I did get around to scraping, oh, look at this, baby's first scraping. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Patchbox, the map that proves that no patch reporter is ever more than five miles from a Starbucks. <laughs> I wrote a little script that scraped the Starbucks website for all of the locations. And then patch was much harder. I actually had to do a bunch of that by hand. And then I threw it into a uh, Google Fusion Tables thing and did a visualization and a map. So um, now I want to talk about why. I can't tell you why you would want to do it, but I can tell you why I did it and why I wanted to do it. I really think that a computer program or a website can stand in opposition to things that suck in the same way that a song can, or a documentary can, or a protest march can. Right? In short, I kind of learned how to program because a lot of things piss me off. Now, I know that's a really strange reaction, you know? Boy, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore and I'm going to learn JavaScript. <laughs> That'll teach the bastards, right? <laughs> but it's true. I learned to program because government corruption is real and has real effects. Because people are getting thrown out of their houses by force because we don't live in a post-racial society. 
because it matters when you cancel a bus line. It affects a lot of people. Because it's really hard to argue that it's an isolated incident when there's a big Google map in your face telling you it's not. And finally, because it's really hard to shut data up. Right? But what it means to me is not all that important. It's much more important to say what this means for journalism. I think that we can use some of these newfound tools not just to um, better the low end of journalism, but to actually increase some of the best, to increase the quality of some of the best journalism we, we do. Now, if you step back and take a look at both the state of journalism and the state of the planet, one of the conclusions you come to pretty quickly is that a lot of our problems are distributed and global. They're not happening in one place to one person. If you think about climate change, the global financial crisis, um, healthcare issues, the foreclosure crisis isn't global, but it's certainly super regional. Um, they're happening all over the place. And yet, our media is consolidated and local, right? And when you apply the tools of narrative journalism to these stories, some of which are the most important stories of our age, they don't really fit together all that well. Like, for instance, with, cl with climate change, what are you gonna do, a interview every penguin? You know, it's just not gonna work, right? So we need these kind of data tools to approach the stories that really matter in our age, right? I wanna give you an example of how we could use those um, to improve some of the best journalism we have. This is actually a picture from a Washington Post package on the treatment of um, veterans at Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital, for which they won a very, very well-deserved Pulitzer Prize um, a few years ago. And I reread it um, last week in preparation for this, uh, for this talk. One of the things that really struck me was how much we as a reader we're, were being expected to take the stories of these individual veterans and have them stand in for all veterans. Now, the problem with that kind of reportage, what you might call journalism by anecdote, is that way too often it leads to scenes like this one, where some weasel gets up behind a podium and says, this is just an isolated incident. Without the data, it's really hard to hold the powerful account to account, and it's hard to make it stick. So one of the things we want to do with our newfound skills is to bring the age of journalism by anecdote to an end. Now, an example of how we could do it better in the future. Um, as a result of uh, battlefield injuries in the Iraq and Afghanistan war, uh, war uh, upwards of 6,000 U.S. service personnel will return to the United States as amputees. It's one of the good news, bad news um, stories of these wars, which is battlefield medicine has become so good that people are surviving injuries that would have killed them previously, right? But they're coming back needing a lot more help. So my question is, how many of these people have been issued their prosthesis by the VA, right? It's not, it's not asking you to go to the moon, but on the other hand, using our typical narrative journalism tools, it would be impossible to do, but it's easy to figure out ways to do that with data. So what I really think we should do is we should turn a lot of stories into signals. Now that sounds super abstract, that sounds like some crazy media lab thing, right? But the fact is we do it all the time. We do it every time we put together a box score. We do it every time we have a stock quote. So ask yourself, what does it mean and who does it benefit? that I can get Apple's stock price every minute of every day that the uh, market is open, but I can't know in the same way important things about healthcare, about education, about the treatment of veterans, and about the environment. If we're going to have a better world, we must have a better journalism. And I know that sounds really intimidating when you're sitting there with your three, three line program and you can't get it to work. But the fact is, it only takes a very small axe to fell a very big tree. And that's it for me. Thanks very much.